What's going on, guys? How are you? Welcome back to the Paper Trails podcast. I'm your host, Nick Caligaramitros, and uh, this is episode 25, and I am thrilled to bring you guys our guest, Chef Mark Allison. We're super pumped to have him uh, on the show. Uh, whether you guys are listening to this via Spotify, Apple Podcast. Uh, or if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, it does not matter. Welcome. We are thrilled to have you. And so um, we are excited to, uh, to bring you guys a lot of the experiences and journeys that, uh, that Chef has, uh, has had over the years, the many travels I've, I've read up on him. And um, it's, it's awesome. It's exciting. You know, I'm, I'm really glad to have him on to be able to learn and, and, and glean on his experiences, his story, his background, and honestly, the things that he's most excited about now moving forward and, and really giving back and, you know, just really creating a lot of uh, awareness about, you know, health and, and cooking and, and everything. And so, uh, Chef Mark, let's start from maybe the beginning. Um, okay. Maybe just introduce yourself to our audience. Let's start uh, where you're from, um, family, upbringing a little bit, you know, let's, let's maybe start there. Okay, Nick, it's a pleasure to be on your show. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, well, my name is Mark Allison. Uh, I am 56 years old okay. and I became a chef at the age of 16. So it's been a long journey, uh, but I tell people I've actually never worked a day in my life because I love what I do. Uh, I became interested in cooking uh, at an early age because uh, my mother turned out to be a really good cook. And my father, when he wasn't working in a factory, actually liked to work in the garden. Okay. So everything basically that we ate actually came out of the garden. Sure. Uh, so I've always loved fruits and vegetables, okay. unlike a lot of people. Okay. Uh, and then when I was at school, um, I was not the brightest. In fact, I was as thick as this uh, table. And um, I was heading out of school, not even getting a high school diploma, because I spent most of my time just staring out the window daydreaming. And uh, But the one thing that I really enjoyed doing was uh, what was called home economics. Okay. And home economics at the time was not just cooking, but it was ironing and cross stitch and all the things that you do sure. around the house. You sure, know? So at the time, this is going back to the 70s, uh, it was rather strange that a guy would take home economics because all my beefed up guys, yep. my friends, yep. they did woodwork and metalwork. Okay. Um, and it was like, you know, he's a bit strange, this guy. He's, yeah. He's, what, what is he doing? <laughs> what's he doing? You know? <laughs> uh, and But I learned very, I, I, I was as thick as this, but yep. I learned quite quick that... Yep. Um, you know what? Girls liked guys who could cook. There we go. And all my friends were in like a hot, sweaty woodwork room or metalwork room yep. with 19 other guys. Yep. I was in an air-conditioned room with 19 girls. There we go. Uh, and <laughs> I just fell in love with cooking. And the other thing I learned straight off the bat was people like chefs yeah. because when they would leave with a, a piece of wood carved into a fish, who cared? <laughs> but when I would leave with a wicker basket full of like uh, cream donuts or cakes or whatever, everybody was following me to the bus station. Nice. So uh, I, I learned pretty quick, you know what, if I can learn how to cook, okay. I'm always gonna be surrounded by people that like food okay. and hopefully like me. Life. So um, I did home economics and when it came to that decision, because it, in England, that's where I'm from. Okay, what part of England? A uh, place called Newcastle upon Tyne, which is the very north of England. It's just below the Scottish border. Okay. So my accent's more Scottish than uh, English. You're a Castle fan? A Newcastle fan, right on. Not doing too good this season, but okay. you know what? They, they never have for years, but I still support <laughs> yes, them. That's it. Uh, I drink a lot of Newcastle brown ale. There we go. Uh, so anyway, at the age of 16, you, you leave school. It's not like America where okay. you're basically pushed to go to university. Okay. Uh, only about the top 15, 20% actually go to university. E even to this day? Even to this day. Okay. You know, um, they don't expect everybody to get a degree. Which might be a good thing, actually. I think in this day and age, um, and, and not criticizing anything over yeah. here, but education's more business than actual education. I agree. No, I, I got my degree, Chef, and you know, I 
you know, the reality is, is that, you know, a lot of people, if they know exactly what they want, okay, I, yeah, I exactly, understand. Yeah, yeah. But if you're just going for just to go because of the peer pressure yeah. and you're accumulating debt, I, I don't see, uh, me personally, this is my opinion, I don't see the value of it. Exactly. I don't. I mean, we can get experience working at a restaurant, a yeah. catering company, go go work at a bank. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do to accumulate, you know. Exactly. That so, experience, that's going to make you a, a, a good wage. hundred uh, percent. I'm all for education. Sure, uh, me too. If you don't know what you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. You've got to learn through education. <laughs> so you've got to learn it somehow. But do you have to pay an astronomical amount to get a degree that is more like a mortgage that you're going to pay back for years. And the same with culinary arts. Sure. If you think about it, how many students have left culinary school on $100,000 and then they get a job making twenty five? dollars yep. Where's the return on investment? Yep. So at the age of 16, I had to make a, a decision what I wanted to do. Okay. And I could either work in the mines, I could work in a car factory, uh, or I could get like a menial sort of job. And I thought, well, let's try this chefing gig. Okay. So I left school on a Friday, and then on a Monday, I already wa- worked into a, a hotel and I had a job. Okay. And um, now, I, was, was that your first job? That was my, actually, that wasn't my first job. Okay. My first job, actually, when I look back, I think, what were my parents thinking? Uh-huh. Uh, I actually started work at 14. Okay. And I used to be a glass collector in a bar. Okay. So, you know, the empty glasses left yeah. on tables, yeah. I would go around with a basket and collect all of them glasses and then nice. wash them, give them back to the bartender. And I did that four nights of the week. That's probably why I never learned anything at school. Um, <laughs> but I, I realized then I, I, I liked being in hospitality. Sure. It was a great way to meet people, you know. And I've always found people in hospitality are the best people. Mm. You know, they've got such a good nature and they want to help people. 100%. So I got a job as a chef okay. and uh, I worked right at the bottom. I was a commie chef. I was peeling onions and uh, defrosting chickens and washing dishes. The basics, yeah. All the basics. And it was a four-star hotel, but I, I learned a, a really good grounding. And after a couple of years, I went over to Jersey in the Channel Islands and I got a job over there. Okay. And then I traveled literally around Europe working. Uh, coming backwards and forwards to England. And then at the age of 24, I thought, you know what? I love what I'm doing, but if I really want to excel or yeah. make something of myself, I really need an education. Okay. So at the age of 24, while I was working full time, I decided I'd go back to night school. So you were, you were already working out for eight years, 16 to 24? Yep. And you work at the hotel for a couple of years, and, and then, then I tra- moved around and I traveled through Europe. What did, what did you What did you learn there? What did you learn What did you learn at the first two years of the hotel? Like, let's start there. Like, well, let's you know, say somebody's watching this right now that is young and kind of like you understands. You know what? I kind of like this hospitality thing. I love serving people. I love the feeling I get, and uh, they want to kind of get their first job. You know, obviously, you learn some of the basics as far as culinary skills. Yeah. You know. Um, but what are some things that you learned in the first two years and then maybe the next, you know, six? I think uh, straight away you're going to know if this is the field for you. That's a good point. Because in my day, and I'm sure it's the same uh, nowadays, I was working split shifts. And really, did you work less than a 12-hour day, you know? Uh, and it might be five days or it might be six days. Yeah. Uh, it might be a bit more uh, organized now. Sure. Um, but... What I loved was I just loved the work because mm. to me it wasn't work. Yeah. I just love being around food. I love being around people. And I love trying different things. It's amazing when I, I used to work at Johnston Wales University, the number of students that would come through and they'd never tried a variety of fruits or vegetables or different kinds of meat. or diff- You could go through the whole course not even touching a piece of fish if you didn't want to. Uh, but I love just being involved with sports. Food. Mm. And I love the aspect of travel because you can watch something on the TV, but unless you actually travel to that destination yeah. and, and walk in their footsteps through them streets sure. and taste the food that they actually sure. taste, sure. meet the people, talk to the people, you don't actually live that experience. To so to point. me, travel has never been uh, a bonus to work. To me, travel has always been the prize to go after to actually work around the world to meet different people, to go to different countries, to different cities, and try new things. Where'd you travel to? I traveled all around Europe. I was in France, I was in Italy, I was in Portugal. Uh-huh. Um, and I met some amazing people, had an amazing time. 
Um, but again, it wasn't work. It was just, you know, actually a passion to be around people. And that, that was the learning experience for me. I didn't have to go to school. I had to go to school eventually to get a qualification to say this is what I know. Sure. But I didn't. You already. You, I already knew. You already what, experienced it. I already knew what I knew, and I knew how far I could go. So at the age of twenty-four, when I came back, it was right. I'll go to night school, okay. and I went to night school for ten years. Okay. Uh, I did five years culinary, then I did a, a degree in education, then I did a master's degree in business. Uh, by then, I was in my thirties, and uh, then it was okay then. I love being in the kitchen, but do I want to be in the kitchen when I get to my age now? Sure. And I thought, you know what? What better than being a culinary instructor? Sure. So uh, I I looked for two years because in England, culinary instructor jobs are really difficult to come by because mm. it's basically Monday to Friday, nine to five. Sure. And you get, usually have about three month vacation during the year. So for two years, I looked, I could not find a job. And then one job came up, I applied, I got an interview and I'm actually sitting with everybody and uh, everybody's like, I wonder who's going to get the job. And I said, well, from what I've heard, somebody will come in and say, hey, John, can you come next door? And that guy's got the job. And just as I said that, this guy came through and says, Mark, can you come next door? <laughs> uh, and I got the job. I love it. And, I love uh, it. And that was in England. That was it. This actually, the job was in Wales. Okay. So uh, I actually was working in Newcastle. Okay. And I moved, I think it's about a 400 mile drive okay. down to Wales and I started. And the funny thing, there was a little funny story there was, I, I didn't know where I was gonna live. Okay. So I rang the tourist board and I'm talking to this girl on the phone and she said, actually my uncle owns a, a rented property. I'm sure he'll be interested in renting it out to you. Okay. So I rang this guy up, he said, yeah, come down. So I ended up driving all the way down to uh, so Wales. So first time to, first time to Wales? This was the second time because I went down for the interview and, okay. then the, and now I was moving for yeah, good. Yeah. So I drive down and I'm in this place called Seven Sisters. Okay. And it's in the middle of nowhere. Okay. You know? And uh, I arrive, meet this guy, and move into this, uh, what you would call a ranch. Okay. Uh, we call them bungalows. So this is late Saturday night, Sunday morning. I hear all this gunfire going on. And you could hear bang, bang, bang. And I'm thinking, what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> So I jump out of bed and I'm looking around, couldn't see anything. And then I go outside and I hear all this gunshot going behind the fence. Okay. So I climb up over the fence and here it was... A, um, a gun range. It, it wasn't such a gun range, but they reenacted OK... Uh, was it Gunfight at the OK Corral every Sunday? All these Welsh guys uh -huh. dressed up as cowboys and ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it was unusual. I'm like looking over this fence thinking, where the hell what is I going alive? on? <laughs> and there's all these big burly Welsh guys like rugby players yeah. shooting each other. <laughs> and that was my first taste of living in Wales. Nice, nice. Let me let me take you back just for a second. I'm curious. You said your mom was a cook. Okay. What Favorite dish that she made? Would you, you know, what, what was your your favorite dish? My mother actually was a cleaner. She uh, okay. worked in a warehouse cleaning, okay. and uh, she was a seamstress on the side. Okay, but she loved to cook. Okay, uh, and I would imagine probably one of her favorite dishes was quiche Lorraine, which is like an egg flan with. Uh, she would normally put in onions and bacon. And the highlight of our week was every Sunday, and that's when I used to help my mother in the kitchen. Uh -huh. Everything on Sunday was homemade. Nice. So she would have a roast. It would either be chicken or a piece of beef or pork or lamb, which was what we, everybody loved in our house was lamb. Yeah, yeah. But then on a Sunday afternoon, everything would be baked. So she'd make apple pie, apple tarts, blackberry pie, uh, quiche Lorraine, all the sandwiches would be handmade. So Sunday was the highlight. You That's know, awesome. because the rest of the week was probably leftovers from the Sunday sure. getting made into something else. That's so interesting. It reminds me of, uh, you know, visiting my, my family is Greek. My dad came over, uh, chef, 35, 40 years ago. You know, he's the oldest of six and very, you know, poor family back home and uh, came to America to make something of himself. Yeah. And, and him and my uncles did. And um, but when I go back home over the summer as a kid, every summer we'd go back for two or three months and uh that's how my, my grandma has a garden and she's got some chickens for eggs and you know she would make what uh, in Greek we call pita, so spanakopita with spinach yeah. and feta and yeah, you know, yeah. tiropita. I mean, it's like literally, it's exactly what you're yeah. saying right now is what I experienced every summer as a kid growing up. 
I, I definitely understand kind of where uh, where you're coming from in that in that sense. Um, cool. I, All right. I, I love that because uh, my parents were the first in our family to actually buy their own house. Nice. Before that, everybody else rented from the government. So when my father and mother went to buy this house, they actually bought it because of the size of the garden, and which was relatively big. And my father would maintain that garden throughout the year. You know, and every season was different fruits, different vegetables. Nice. So it was amazing. Nice. Yeah. What, uh, from your travels real quick before you started school, favorite favorite place? Did you like Italy, uh, Portugal, France? Well, actually, uh, I loved all around Europe. Okay. But my all-time favorite place came on later in life was okay. uh, when I went actually teaching Singapore. And Singapore, okay. if you ever get the chance to go to I Singapore, would, yeah. it is absolutely amazing. What did you like about it? Um... It's probably the cleanest place I've ever been. No kidding. Um, and everybody's so nice, but the food is unbelievable. You can go to a hawker stall, which are like uh, a variety of different types of Asian type food. Okay. And uh, you could just pick whatever you want and you sit in a big communal seating area and you just eat this absolutely beautiful food that's been freshly made. And it was dirt cheap. You know, I don't know what the cost would be now, uh, but the one of the hawker stalls I went to had a one-star Michelin starred restaurant okay. and you could get chicken. All he made was chicken and rice. That's all he made. And he was a one-star Michelin uh, restaurant, but it was like $3. And it was probably the cheapest Michelin starred restaurant in the world. Ever. But the food was absolutely amazing. Nice. But Singapore was absolutely fabulous. Okay. Uh, I taught at a, a school there called At Sunrise. And uh, the students again were phenomenal. And we would make something that day and join another uh, group of students and would all sit outside on one big table and everybody would eat what was made. And it was just amazing. Love that, you know? love that, okay. So Singapore was probably the best place. Okay, nice, so uh, 34, you got to school, you got some degrees, uh, MBA I think, and yep. so you're, you're teaching, you're in Wales, yep. okay. And how long are you there for? How long are you in Wales for? Uh, I actually went at 30. And I continued the night school until I was 34 okay. when I got that degree. Okay. Uh, that's where I met my wife. Okay. Uh, my wife was one of my students. Okay. But she wasn't 18. Okay. She was 30 years old. Okay. Same age as no me. judgment here. Uh, I feel like good, good. <laughs> uh, And she actually uh, worked as a salesperson for okay. British Gas. Okay. And then she had this uh, really weird idea that she wanted to get in hospitality at the age of 30. Okay. So she came one night a week to learn how to cook, and that's when I met her, and then one night a week to learn management. And um, we, uh, to tell the truth, I didn't even uh, notice my wife to begin with, okay. okay? Because like in Wales, you go to culinary school and you're not allowed to wear makeup or anything, and you come in in your uniform, okay. and that's it. So anyway, there was a power cut one night, and uh, everybody's walking around with candles because there's no light and all my students were coming in. I'm saying, sorry, but there's no class tonight. You'll have to go home. And as usual, this lady was always late. And she's <laughs> walking up the corridor and I'm thinking, wow, my God, she's beautiful. Who's yeah, this? Yeah. And uh, she must be one of the bacon pastry students. Yeah. And, and she went, oh, Chef Allison. She said, I'm sorry I'm late, as usual. She said, uh, but what's happening tonight? And I, and I went, oh. Alison Davis, and she went, yes. And I went, I'm sorry, but we've had a power cut. We're not having a class tonight. Um, so everybody's just got to go home. So she turned around and said, so what are you doing tonight? And I went, well, actually, I'm just going home. She said, well, why don't we go for a drink? Nice. And that was it. <laughs> so um, we started dating. I love that. <laughs> we started dating, and yeah. like, all our friends were like saying, so what happens if you marry this guy? You're going to be called Alison Allison. That's right, Alison and, Davies, Alan uh, Markham. But she was smart enough to keep her name a Davis. <laughs> so we ended up getting married. And, uh, nice, that's awesome. We're, we're, I've got three boys now. Nice. Uh, but at the time, uh, two boys came along, and, yeah. and, and that's when I got offered to go to Alaska. Okay, yeah, so, I, I read that. So, the, so you're in Wales when you got that offer. Now, was that like... Did you know about this pro? What's the program again? That's it's the Fulbright Teachers Exchange Program. Okay. And, and it was developed just after World War II okay. to actually bring the world together through education. Interesting. So people would uh, basically exchange jobs, houses, cars, everything. So I, I got uh, approached to go on this uh, scheme. And uh, I always wanted to 
to come to America because, you know, living in England, you're brought up on Starsky and Hutch and streets of San Francisco. Okay. And it's like, oh, everybody wants to go to America. Sure, sure. So I thought, let's go to America for a year, thinking I'd go to California. Okay. So I applied and I was one of 33 people in the whole of England that got accepted. And there was 500 Americans coming over Europe. So it's kind of like an exchange program. An exchange program. So uh, what happens would be somebody would come and do my job and live in my house. For a year. Gotcha. Okay? Gotcha. They would drive my car. Okay. So, uh, so a literal swap of everything. The only thing we didn't swap was wife. <laughs> and, uh, and I was quite happy with it. Even though his wife was beautiful and she was nice, I was quite happy with the one I had. So, uh, what anyway, was that like, Alaska? Well, we thought we were going to California, okay. but if I taught math or English or anything but culinary, I could have went anywhere. Okay. But out of 500 instructors, there was one culinary instructor. That you could have swapped with. And he was called Glenn Denkler, and he was a great guy. Uh-huh. Um, he was a pilot in Vietnam, then he became an air traffic controller, and then I think it was the time Ronald Reagan was in power, he sacked every air traffic controller in the country. Okay. So he went to culinary school, became a chef, and okay. he ended up in Alaska. So his daughter had won a scholarship in Oxford University. And she had been there three years, and he had applied for three years in a row, and nobody would go to Alaska. So we actually turned it down because my uh, son was two, and my other son Matthew was eight months at yeah, the time. Yeah. And so we turned it down, and and then about three weeks later, the telephone rang, and here was Glenn ringing from Alaska, yeah. saying, "Hey, Mark, why are you not coming over?" Please. <laughs> and he's like, don't listen to anything you've heard about Alaska. You know, it doesn't snow that often and it gradually gets below minus. What a liar. <laughs> so I agreed on the phone. Okay. Nick. I agreed on the phone that we would move over. Hadn't spoke to your wife. You just, you just. I, I didn't speak to my wife. I just agreed. Let's do it. Then I went downstairs, told my wife. Uh -huh. And as you can imagine, because I'm, are you married? I'm not. Are you not married? No. Well, it's all to come. Yes. She went in the kitchen and all hell broke out. There was pots and pans getting smashed in <laughs> cups. And then you know what, for about a month, silence. Nothing. I got the cold shoulder. How, how, uh, how soon did you have to move? Like, well, like, like it, since was about, it was about two months later. Uh, but we moved. And we met Glenn in Washington, D.C. Then we flew out to Alaska. Nice guy, uh, Glenn? He was a great guy. Absolutely, Him and his wife were absolutely tremendous. Uh, and then we moved to Alaska, and uh, we were 10 miles outside of Anchorage. Okay. And there was only five other houses in our neighborhood. But it was beautiful. It was just like a picture what was postcard. It, like? it was it, it, absolutely amazing. Just like what you would think uh, a picture of Alaska in winter would be. Apart from there was no snow then. Uh, but it was beautiful. It was everything. It was absolutely gorgeous. And the people were amazing. No kidding. And the, uh, we arrive on the weekend, and the... Um, principal of the school I was going to work at, he rings me up and he's like, Mark, what are you doing this weekend? I said, nothing. He said, come to our house. We're having a barbecue, welcoming you. He said, I've got a hot tub. He said, swimwear is optional. Come through. Nice. And I'm like, my principal in my college, you see, twice a year. <laughs> day one of opening, day two of closing. And that was it. And this guy's on the phone inviting us through to a barbecue. That's awesome. So we went through and good, good uh, met him and he was great. And all the people I worked with were absolutely tremendous. We had an absolutely unbelievable year. So much so my wife didn't want to leave at the end. Really? She loved it. Change your heart, huh? Change your heart. But one thing that changed my whole sort of aspect about culinary, because sure. I was uh, trained classically in French cuisine. So okay. a lot of butter, sugar, salt, cream. Um, was the fact that my eight-month-old son was now 14 okay. month, and he became ill. And uh, so we took him to the doctors and uh, the doctor said, I think he's just got a bad case of cold. You'll be fine in a week. Sure. So a week went by and he lost a load of weight and um, he was drinking a lot of fluids. And I just happened to be talking to my brother that weekend on the phone back in England mm -hmm. and he's a type one diabetic. Okay. He has been since he was 15 years old. Okay. And he said, I think you should take him back to the doctor and get his blood tested because I think he's a diabetic. Uh -huh. So we took him was back. Was that just an intuition he had? Yep. Just the fact that he had lost a lot of weight. He was uh, drinking a lot of fluids. Okay. His diapers were always uh, wet. Yeah. So we took him back to the doctors and uh, we had a bit of a standoff with the doctor because the doctor said he's only 14 months. There's nobody ever been recorded that young to yeah. be a type 1 diabetic. Uh -huh. The average age would probably be about seven or eight years old. 
So we said, well, we're not actually moving from your office unless he's tested. So we sat there for about 30 minutes and then eventually she said, okay, then we'll test it. Well, within 30 minutes, he was in intensive care. His blood sugars were through the roof. Mm -hmm. And we were later told that if we had never went in on that day, he would have been in a coma that night and possibly could have died the next day. Wow. So that whole thing changed my life. He was in intensive care for a week. And, and then, of course, he's on two injections a day. And then you've got to count your carbohydrates and look at the diet and different things. Whole lifestyle change. Whole lifestyle change. So that changed the whole lifestyle for us as a family. The whole family. So we started looking at, uh, you know, whole foods, fresh fruits and vegetables again, uh, cut out all processed foods, reduce meat intake, dairy intake. And that's my whole path now was looking at nutrition and health. Yeah, because I mean, family is everything. And exactly. here's your son and you want to take care of him. Yep. So how much longer were you in Alaska after after this ordeal? Uh, that was in April and then we left Alaska in June and okay. then we traveled for two months. We went to, um, it was funny, you're living in Alaska for a year. And then we actually, tra actually we left the 4th of July. It was the 4th of July. Okay. We uh, landed in uh, Laguna Beach, California. Okay. And then we decided, this is this is America. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this and, is what uh, everybody was beautiful. Yeah. Everybody was tanned. Everybody was like in what years? What years? This is nineteen ninety nine. And then we did we did uh, six weeks in Laguna Beach and traveled that? that whole area. It was it? absolutely amazing. I never been to California. Oh, go. it's absolute. If if I could pick a place to live, it's California. always been Laguna Beach. No kidding. It's absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. The weather, what, everything? The weather's fabulous. It's like a bay sort of area and it's all restaurants and art and everybody's really nice. It's obviously uh, astronomical to live there. I know, I've heard, um, I've heard. And then we, we flew over and we went to Boston and Cape Cod and we traveled all down there for about wow. three weeks and then we flew back there. history there? Yeah. Nice. And then after so Boston, you went where? I didn't... We, we flew out of Boston, went to Cape Cod, okay. we, uh, toured some of the beaches, and then we flew back to England. Nice. Uh, it was fabulous. The whole year was, a, 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 apart from Matthew becoming sure. a diabetic, the whole, like, the whole year was a great experience. So you went back to teaching again? You were, you, I, I mean, what I, was your, 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 now, did you, did you know, since you started teaching, that's what I want to do? Like, was that something like, once you got into it, you're like, you know what, like, this is my life's passion? Or is this something just, you know, what you were kind of thinking about the future and you said, you know what, I don't want to be in the stress of the kitchen my whole life. Is that, I mean, how did, how did you know, you, the thought no, process? The thought process was, you know, uh, let's look at this teaching. But I've got to be honest, I love teaching. Again, that was my passion. Yeah. I love being a chef, yeah. but I love the aspect of actually showing people how to cook. I love because that. that's that's one of the biggest issues we've got in this country and also in England is the fact that nobody cooks anymore. You know, and if you're eating a lot of processed foods, then you don't know what you're putting in your body because it's loaded with chemicals. Yeah. Um, so I, I just fell in love with education. Okay. And I worked in that job at Neathport Talbot College for 10 years, and I'm extremely competitive. I used to be. I've slowed down now. <laughs> um, it's still so. I uh, over a ten-year period. Okay. I worked with different culinary st students, different teams, and we won every major competition in Europe. Every one. Every one. We won. How many competitions do you think you did? Uh, over a ten-year period, we must have done about thirty competitions, and we never came less than third place. Uh, we had a fifty percent success rate of winning competitions. If we didn't win it the first time, we won it the second time. Nice. And then in uh, 2000, uh, the biggest competition in Europe at the time was called the Nestle Talk Door, and over 200 colleges would compete every year. And that was the one competition we hadn't entered. And I had this five-year vision of winning this competition. Okay. So what happens is you put a team of three students together, you come up with a restaur restaurant competition, and the competition's over a nine-month period. Oh, wow. And you submit your recipes, you submit your concept, you submit uh, a financial plan of how you would uh, put this, re this restaurant together. Sure. And then they pick the top 30 teams, and then these teams compete against each other at like a, a culinary competition. Yeah. And out of them 30 teams, they pick four, and then they take them to London, and at a big uh, culinary festival there, or a, like a home and gardens type show, your students actually run a restaurant for one day with your concept. So for four days, there's four different colleges competing against each other to see who wins. So the first year we entered, 
we won. Nice. And what was the concept? Do you remember? We did the Red Fish Grill. Okay. And it was actually based on a concept in New Orleans. Okay. Uh, and it was all about fish. Because I looked at previous winners and nobody chose fish. Okay. Because nobody wants to deal with 120 portions of fish that has to be cooked perfect yeah. to paying customers. Because these customers are paying. Yeah. You know? So anyway, we did that, the Red Fish Grill, and it won. And the prize was $20,000 to the college. Okay. And 10 days all expense paid trip for me and the students to come to America. Nice. So we went to uh, DC, New York, Boston, and then we went to Rhode Island. And, and Rhode Island is where Johnson & Wales University is, their okay. main headquarters. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so we met everybody there. Now, did, a, did, did you know Rhode Island? I mean, did you know Johnson & Wales already, or you just happened that we finished up Rhode I'd, Island? I basically heard about Johnson & Wales because it got a really good reputation. Okay. And then we went, we had a great time, and then uh, the following year comes, and uh, I decide to enter another team, and everybody's, you must be completely nuts because nobody in a 30-year history has ever won two Nestle Talk Doors. Yeah. So I entered a completely new group of students, uh -huh. new concept. Yeah. In fact, it was called Laguna Beach. Nice. It was the concept. Nice. And we won again. We, ne we, never before we, done. We, had, we became the first college ever to win two back-to-back -to -back talk doors. I love that. So again, $20,000 to the college. We get taken back over to America. And of course, the second time I go to Rhode Island, I meet the same people I met the first time, and, and I get offered a job to come and work at Johnson & Wales. No kidding. So uh, in 2004, we moved from uh, Wales yeah. over to America. Initially, I was supposed to go to Providence, Rhode Island. Yeah. And about six months before we left, I was asked to go and help with the closure of the Charleston campus, which had been there for 22 years. Okay. So we moved to Charleston and we had an absolute blast because by then James had arrived, so I had three boys. And we lived on Folly Beach for a year. Let me ask you a question. I want to I want to take you back. I'm like this is I'm actually curious. Do you think your drive and your competitive nature helped encourage or aid the students in just making like that that, that did it help them get a little more competitive to win because Oh, I think so, yeah. I I, I think if you you've just I think before we came on, you were talking about um, success principles. I yeah. think one of the big principles is you've got to surround yourself with people with the same motivation as you, or even more motivation, because that rubs off on you. 100%. And, I, and I definitely think that's with students. Um, it, like before we even started this, and you mentioned two of my ex-students, and I said, I only remember the really, really good and the really, really bad. It. I love to teach anybody. Yeah. But... I really love to teach people who are motivated and yeah. want to learn yeah. because you get so many people that just jump through the hoops to get the qualification sure. and they miss out on so much. Sure. You know, so every student who ever was on a culinary team that I uh, organized always had a passion to do well for themselves. 100%. You know? Here's, here's why I ask because, you know, there's, there's owners that are going to see this and uh, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes. The reality is, you know, I mean, John Maxwell talks about it all the time. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it starts at the top. If you have a CEO, if you have a president, if you have a dean of students, if you have a restaurateur, if you have a chef that is complacent, that is not, that's going to rub off. Oh, definitely. Or on the, uh, the same token, on the opposite side of the spectrum, when you've got, a, a, a teacher that is driven and they want to win and they're obsessed and they want to make sure that these students learn and, and experience. I mean, I, it's just something that I thought about. I'm like, you know what? Like a, as you're talking, I'm like, you know what? I, in my mind, even before you answered the question, I knew it. I knew it was going to be yes, because yeah, like you are who you hang out with. I mean, you are. You, you, to me, you've got to, uh, the only way you can improve is, uh, by improving yourself and being around people that want the best for you. 100%. And you'll always find, and I've found this in my career, is you, you admire people and you look up to people. Sure. And But they'll, they're more than likely willing to help you sure. get to that next step on sure. the ladder. You know? And I've always been one that 
if somebody wants help, I'll support them sure. and support them 100% to try and get them to where they want to be. But I think you've got to motivate yourself first. And then you will actually draw them people to you. Mm, that's a good point. That are going to help you with your career. You attract who you are, not what you want. I, I have been, uh, touch wood, I have never applied for a position since that last job in Neath Port Talbot College uh, when I was 30 years old. Every job I've had since, somebody has picked up the phone and offered me the job. They sought you out. Yeah. And I think that comes with if you are passionate about what you do mm -hmm. and you give 100% every day, mm -hmm. then people are going to hear about that and you get noticed. I love that. Did you have a mentor being in culinary? Uh, when, I was a, uh, when I eventually went to culinary school, there was a really good guy uh, called Stuart Hughes. Uh -huh. uh, and he was phenomenal. And I always remember uh, Stuart giving me a great piece of advice when I, I finally got a job teaching. <coughs> and I said, Stuart, I'm only 30 years old. I don't think I know enough, even though I've been cooking since I was 16. And he said, Mark, he said, you're going to know 99% more than any of your students. And then if you get that one student that asks you a question and you don't know the answer to, he said, it's simple. You say, Nick, that's a great question. Did you hear that, everybody? That's a great question. That's homework tonight. You come back to me tomorrow with that answer. Love it. And he said, that gives you that night to find out the answer. You go in the next day, you ask him to see if he's actually found out the answer himself. And he said, don't worry about not knowing the answer. He said, there's always a way. He said, but you will probably know 99% more than what they do. I love that. You know, and I'm, I'm always one for, I learn something new every day. Sure. You know, sure. I don't know everything about cooking, but I learn something every day. And I think if you've got that passion about education, you you can learn something new every day, yeah. even about yourself. Sure. It doesn't have to be a cooking technique. Sure. It could be something about you or something about something else or how it works. I love that. Okay, so now we're in Charleston. We're in Charleston. How, so how is Charleston just as a... Charleston is amazing. I've, I've, I've heard from a lot of sh chefs that I've interviewed, it's like a it's like a foodie city. It's a, I it's, mean, it's, it's, it's a, a very unique... Uh, Johnson Wills were there for 22 years and practically... Every restaurant in Charleston has got a Johnson Wills grad in. No kidding. And the food is phenomenal. The city is absolutely beautiful. We had the pleasure of living on Folly Beach, which is like a little island okay. off Charleston. Okay. So my boys played on the beach every day. Oh, man. Uh, and then we would go into town. What year is this? This is, this is now 2004 going on 2005. Okay. And then I'm working down in Charleston. And I've got to be honest, out of... 20 years of education, that was my best, my favorite year in education, because okay. it was my first year at Johnson Wales. Okay. But the students were phenomenal. Why do you think that is? Uh, they just, I, I don't know if it was that time span, but the students were just so nice. It was great. Uh, and I'll tell you another little story here. Uh -huh. yeah. I got hired to teach Garmanger, which is cold presentation, you know, salads, canapes, okay. uh, ballantines, galantines. And part of the course was ice carving. So That's interesting. We, we got held up and I missed the first three days and they'd sent a guy down from Providence to show me uh, how to teach this class because at Johnston Wales, it used to be a nine day rotor. So every nine days, you taught the same subject but to a different group of students. Interesting. So I missed the first three days. So I missed the ice carving. So anyway, I work with this guy, comes to the second segment, yeah. you're repeating it. Yeah. Now I've got to carve a 300 pound block of ice. I have never <laughs> carved ice in my life. Okay. How'd that pan out? <laughs> I went to the library. I got two DVDs and a book on ice carving. I love that. And then I went in the next day and pretended I could carve ice. No kidding. So my swan, which looked more like a turkey, <laughs> yeah. uh, it still impressed the students, <laughs> believe it or not. The students still thought I was like God. They, they thought my ice, my turkey looked phenomenal. I mean, those... But the good thing about that, Nick, was every nine days, yeah. I got another 300 pound block of ice. There we go. To carve. Hey. So by the end of the year. Oh, you were perfect. Oh, I was, it was brilliant. A, it was a swan. I was brilliant. <laughs> but the, the one good thing there, uh, each class had a teaching uh, assistant. Yeah. And my teaching uh, assistant was called Brian Hudson. Uh -huh. And I'm still really good friends with him now. Nice. He 
had carved ice before. Nice. So he was giving me pointers <laughs> remember? as we were carving ice. Yeah. And uh, believe it or not, I, I taught that subject for four years. No kidding. Not one. You know, you, you're dealing with ice and electric chainsaws. Who ever thought of that, right? But not one accident in four years. So is, I count is, myself pretty lucky. Is that still uh, is that still the it's rotation? Not, it's like not, nine uh, at Johnson and Wells now or no? Uh, unfortunately, no. It's a different. I left just when they were changing the curriculum. Did you like um, that? I'm, I'm just curious. Every now. nine days. Yeah. Uh, did you like uh, that or no? Well, uh, after four years, we moved to Chol. Uh, well, I was going to move to Providence, and then I got invited to move to Charlotte. Yeah. And we came up and. Uh, Fell in love with Charlotte. Yeah. Um, but I used to like the nine days. But the un the unfortunate thing about every nine days is it sort of loses its, loses its excitement yeah, because like every nine sense. days you're teaching the same subject, you're telling the same jokes, yeah. you're doing the same techniques. Yeah. But it's all changed now, and it's changed for the better. Which I mean, I just me putting myself in your shoes. I mean. A lot of life is just relationships and meeting people, and nine days is just too too quick to really establish. You know what I mean? Well, well, you know what? It's amazing because you don't know one person day one, and yeah. then by day nine, it's like the part of your family. It's it's a it, because classes are six hours long. Oh wow! So you've got them for six hours, nine days in a row. Gotcha. And you really get to know these kids, sure. these students, um, and. My, I was at Johnson Wales 10 years and I, I don't think I ever had a, a bad student, you know? Yeah. Uh, but then in 2008, I, I got uh, promoted to the Dean. Okay. So Is that up here in Charlotte or is that still down in Charleston? How, how, we, how long were you in Charleston for? For one year. Okay, so you were, you we, were literally there as they were wrapping it up. I, I was helping with the closure. And then halfway through that year, I was supposed to be going to Providence yeah. and uh, the Dean of the Charlotte campus rang me up and said, look, I've got a position here. Why don't you come to Charlotte? Yeah. So we came up one week and we fell in love with Charlotte and uh, that was the best decision I ever made Nice. Uh, to come to Charlotte. So in 2005, we moved up here Okay. Um, and then um, we worked at this absolutely amazing facility. And, uh, and then 2008, I was offered the job as the Dean. No kidding. So this um, kid who was from Newcastle, who left with not one qualification to his name, was now uh, the Dean of Culinary Arts How'd at one feel? of the most prestigious schools in the world. How'd that feel? It was absolutely tremendous. It was, it, it, it's funny, you, you talk about uh, success principles. I've always been a goal setter. And when I was offered the job at Johnson & Wales, even before we left the country, in my mind, I was already the dean. You're so talking I, about when you visited after winning yeah. the, the very, what year was that? This is uh, 2000, two, th 2001 and then 2002 we won again. So you went up there, mate? When I, when I went to Providence for the first time, I just had this vision in my mind, I'd work for this school at some stage and I'd be the dean. So that was even before I was offered a job and even before I came to America. Yeah, seven years later. Yeah. 2008, right? Uh, yeah, oh, 2008, I, I ended up becoming the dean. Uh, so I was now in charge of 1,400 students, uh, 40 teachers and 10 staff, and a $10 million budget. Uh, this kid from Newcastle. It's who, amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. Life is amazing. Life is amazing. How old were you when, when you became a dean? Uh, let's have a look. Uh, Forty-four. So almost thirty years yeah. since you started cooking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, but then life is never always good. Yeah. It's never always rosy. Zigzagging. Uh, two thousand eight, I became the dean, and yeah. um, and then two thousand and eight, my wife had a problem, and she had to go in the hospital and find out what that problem was. Okay. And she had a tumor in her stomach. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, you know what, this is uh, pretty routine. We're just gonna go in and take that tumor out and you'll be fine. Okay. So we went into hospital and my wife uh, had the tuna tumor removed. 
but unfortunately, when they were removing that tumour, they found another 16 tumours in her liver. Mm. And uh, so when she came out of the operating room, we were told that uh, she had a, a rare blood cancer called carcinoid syndrome, which liked to deposit itself in the liver. And she probably had cancer for the past 10 years previous to it being diagnosed. Uh -huh. um, and with the number of tumours that she had in her liver, uh, and, and no um, medication or surgery was going to be involved, that my wife had three years to live. Mm. Uh, so you can imagine uh, being told that in 2008 uh, with three boys and a wife that you absolutely adored, who was your soulmate and best friend, it was a bit of a shock to the system. I'm sure. So uh, just like when we changed our eating habits for Matthew, we sort of changed our eating habits for my wife and gotcha. we basically put her on a plant-based diet. Okay. She still ate a small amount of meat and um, dairy items, but mainly fruits and vegetables. Okay. And um, uh, she was doing so well and uh, she managed to survive for eight years before she passed away in 2015. More, more memories created. Yeah, you know, because uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, my wife was uh, a person that lived every day of her life. She was passionate about life. Uh, what she loved most was vacations with the boys. So every year we went on two vacations. We went to Disney World eight times in a row. Nice. Uh, and then we traveled all over, we went down the Caribbean and did different things, went back to England and uh, we had a blast. And there was not one day that she didn't live her life to the fullest. I love that, I love that. So that has now become your uh, maybe life's mission, maybe something that you're passionate about now? Uh, you know, I'm still all about education. Sure. Uh, even though I'm not a teacher. Uh, but again, it comes down to you know what you know, and uh, people don't know that actually food is medicine. Sure. It's not a cure. Yeah. If you've already got cancer and uh, some chronic disease, it's not a cure. Yeah. Uh, but when you consider 85% of all chronic diseases, uh, heart disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes, is food related, mm. then if you look after your diet, and you exercise and you get out in the fresh air and you get some vitamin D from the sun yep. uh, and you l l are mindful about what stress you put on yourself, sure. then you can push back major diseases. I love that. I mean, what was it? One of the one of the Greek philosophers, I don't remember if it was Socrates, but he said, what did he say? He said, Mo he said, everything starts in the gut or something like that? It does. It? Every, everything, what you put in your mouth will end up in your stomach, and, and from the stomach, it's going to go around your body. It's so interesting that he's, he said that thousands of years exactly. ago. Exactly. The unfortunate thing, again, it's, is um, we live in a capitalist society, and it's great. If you want to become a multi-millionaire, I think you've got more chance in America than anywhere in the world. I okay? agree. But you're not gonna make money out of healthy people. Mm. Doctors don't make money out of healthy people. Pharmacists don't make money out of he healthy people, okay? Big food corporations really are selling food that have got a lot of preservatives in, and chemicals in, and we don't know long-term what these are doing to sure. people. And they sell them so cheap that people will buy cheap substitutes sure. for fresh fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and nuts, and beans, and seeds, mm -hmm. and lean proteins, such as meats. And I really think that one of the biggest issues we've got in this country, and around the world, sure. it's not just America, sure. but people need to learn how to cook. Okay. And then at least you've got a better idea of what actually you're putting in your body. Yeah, that's amazing. That you know? sense. Yeah. I'm 57 years old. I just had my medical uh, about three months ago. And um, my overall cholesterol is less than uh, 149. If you, there's no document or documentation of anybody having a heart attack with the cholesterol under 150. Okay? So, I feel that I'm actually doing something to benefit myself. It's good. And what I want to do is help other people realize that, you know what, if you actually cook at home and you know what you're eating yep. and you get out and you exercise, you don't have to be killing yourself exercise, just get out and walk. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But you could do your health a lot better. I actually, 
asked for a calcium scan on my heart because two of my friends my age have just recently had heart attacks. So I go for this. The doctor said, you don't need one. I can tell you that now. He said, there's less than a 3% chance you're going to have a heart attack in the next 10 years. Yeah. But if you want to know for sure, go. Yeah. My calcium in my heart was zero. Nice. So I know at least I haven't got heart disease. There might be something else there, but yeah. you know, but at this moment in time, I feel great. Uh, since around about 2008, I- 12 years. Around about 12 years, I will, um, I my three boys still live with me okay. at home, yeah. okay? Uh, so I cook every night. So I know what they're eating nice. as well. I yeah. know what I'm eating. Sure. Uh, and I rarely eat processed foods. Yeah. You know? Or if it's something processed, it might be five ingredients or less, like pasta or bread, you know? Uh, but I rarely eat processed foods. So what, and now you said one of the things that people, uh, you would love to do is have them cook more. How can people learn how to cook more or better or what, what you know? YouTube, I mean, what resources are there for anybody listening, watching, hearing this? There's probably more resource, uh, resources now than there's ever been. It's true. And even with this pandemic going on, yeah. you know, I used to teach in this kitchen here, yep. the Cabarrus Health Alliance, yep. uh, to the general public. Okay. Now we do it all on Zoom okay. or we do it on Facebook. And there's, there's more information out there now on the web. Uh, and there's more cooking uh, programs on TV than ever before. It's just taking the time. Like, it's like anything. If you haven't got the time, you're not going to learn. But you've yeah. got to find the time. Yeah. And to me, I don't take any kind of uh, medication. And I'm unique because four out of every five Americans are on some kind of prescription medication. Mm. And once you're on a prescription medication, it's very difficult to get off it. So the, the goal is to not actually get on it in the first place sure. and hopefully by eating whole foods and looking at your lifestyle, hopefully you never will. Yeah. But once you're on medication, it's very difficult to get off. It's interesting. I, I always uh, say, and I've said a couple times in some previous episodes that there's no lack of answers out there. There's just lack of desire to find those answers. Exactly. So yeah. there's so there's resources. Oh, there's resources. And no matter what county you live in, right? Actually, can anybody plug into this? Uh, oh yeah. Compares? Yeah. yeah. How, how, anyway, can they, how can they find it goes more information all around the world? It, it, how you, can they find more information about? Uh, you just go on the Cabarrus Health Alliance website. Okay. And all our cooking classes and everything to do about this place is on there. Now tell these guys what the Cabarrus Health Alliance is. What do you? I mean, what what roles do you have now? I am the executive chef of culinary innovation. So my job at the Cabarrus Health Alliance is actually to teach the population of uh, Rouen and Cabarrus and Concord how to actually cook, okay. how to uh, pick foods, whole foods, how to prepare them and how to cook and how right. to live a, li a healthier lifestyle. Uh, and what we do here is we've got nurses here, we've got doctors here, we've got a dental department here, we've got environmental health, and it's all to do with the local community. I love that. To actually serve them as a resource to make their lives better. It's a it. it's a great place. I've worked here two and a half years, and it's a you like it. Out. It's it's fabulous. Yeah, it's a great place. Love it, love it. Cool. Uh, let's do some parting thoughts. Parting all right, thoughts. What uh, what would you like to tell? Tell anybody out there that's listening. I think we'll always say success is money. Sure. And it's not because success is if you're a good father or you're a good husband yeah. or you're a good friend to somebody mm. or if you enjoy what you actually do for a living. You know, I, I've been extremely lucky in the fact that I love food and I love to work with food and I love to be around people who like to be around food because I always find them to be the most passionate people around, alive. Yeah. Um, and to me, it's always been a pleasure to work in this industry. And you don't have to go to culinary school sure. to become a good chef. Just find a good chef, yeah. go and work for him, get paid, yeah. and learn from him. Yeah. And it's like it's like anything else. It's a small community. Yeah. All these guys at the very top know each other. Yeah. So if you can work for one of these guys, you can work for another one of them guys. And eventually, you become that guy. you know. And then you're helping somebody else move up the ladder. For me, uh, I just love being around these sort of people. And I just love being around people who have got a really strong desire for life. I love that, I love that. F uh, favorite food? What do you like? Favorite food? I love uh, Thai, Asian style food because okay. it's always fresh, it's always made quick, uh, it's always full of flavor. Um, but I love every kind of cuisine. 
you know, that's, that's again, I, 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 even trying to get my boys to eat vegetables yeah. is a process. Uh, but I've been lucky that I love everything that's good for you. Love so uh, it's just a matter, of, it's like anything, you know, it's perseverance and eventually you'll like it. Amen, amen, yeah. you're preaching, I love it. Appreciate you guys, this was awesome, awesome. I appreciate it, Chef Mark Allison, episode 25 on the Paper Trails podcast, guys. Uh, find him, you know, I mean, find Chef Mark. He, I mean, I think this was amazing. There was Thank so you. much wisdom. Um, and just your story. I mean, we, I mean, people are, if they think and really just listen to what you said, they, they can extract so much to bring value to their life, whether that is through health or family or uh, quality time or it uh, doesn't matter. I mean, uh, there is so much there. Uh, perseverance, uh, competition, uh, wanting to win, desire. I mean, that was all, all you know, there. And so uh, love it. Appreciate it so much. You guys need to, um, you know, learn how to cook, eat, <laughs> eat healthier, right? Fruits, right? Fruits, veggies. Fruits, vegetables, you know, fruits, seeds, beans. I, that's it. I mean, oh, you know, man. let's let's make an effort. You know, we're we're what in uh, almost mid December of 2020. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are gonna make some decisions to try to be a little healthier next year. And so, you know what? Let's uh, let's do some work. Let's do some research, and yeah. uh, you know, we'll be. Um, We'll be healthier. So exactly. anyway, appreciate you so much. Thank you guys. If you guys have not yet subscribed, liked, commented, you know, share this episode, you know, with some friends that maybe would love to uh, to hear more of Chef's background and his story. And so uh, anyway, with that, appreciate you guys, and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Okay.